Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy New Year. Happy, happy, just happy. Um, it's good to see you here this morning. Have, have you ever been thirsty? And I don't mean just like a, I feel like I need a drink, but have you ever been really, really thirsty? When I was in uh, high school, we, we did a few camps. And on one of these camps, we, we had to walk through this certain area, and in this area was a place called Heartbreak Hill. Now, we'd heard the grades before us talk about Heartbreak Hill, and they'd said, oh, it's, it's, it's horrible, it's the worst place, you don't want to do it, and they'd talk about it for weeks after their camp. But this time, it was our turn to do the camp that attacked Heartbreak Hill. And it wasn't on the first day, it was on the second day that we, we came to the area. And we're in the, in the bottom of a valley, and it went up both sides, as valleys tend to do. And we had to go up this track. It was hot, it was sunny, it was windy. This was in um, Queensland, southeast Queensland, it was humid. We had some water. And with all this in our packs, we started up Heartbreak Hill. And we could see the top, and we thought, I have no idea what everyone's complaining about. Piece of cake. So we walked up it, and about half an hour later, we'd have gotten to that top bit. There's nothing heartbreaking about that, it's simple. We walked for a little bit, and then saw that it went up even further. Two hills, that's not that bad. We got to the top of that one, there was another one after that. This kept going for about six hours. You just keep going up, keep going up, keep going up. And each time we'd reach what we thought was the top of the hill, we'd have a big drink going, yes, we've made it. But then we'd get to the top of the next hill, and slowly we see that our water bottles are dropping pretty fast. They were empty well before we reached the top. So by the time we finally got to the top of Heartbreak Hill, we had nothing to drink. And the one thing that we were thinking of, oh, I just need a drink. I, need, I want some water. I don't want juice. I don't want something fizzy. I just want a big, it could even be warm. I didn't really care. I just wanted a big gallon of water. We were thirsty. And thirst is, if you look it up, thirst is actually defined as the lack of liquid needed to sustain life. A lack of the liquid needed to keep life going, to keep you living. You can go weeks without food. You can only go days without water. The story is told of a, um, a US Marine who was on the USS Nimitz as it was patrolling the Iranian Sea in 96. And if you've been on an aircraft carrier, they're huge. It's like football fields floating on the water. But somehow, Joey Mora fell off. He fell into the ocean. The Nimitz kept on moving, and no one noticed that he was missing. No one noticed for 36 hours. When they finally figured out, Joey's not here, they, started, they set out a patrol, and they started a search and rescue operation to try and find him, and they, they traced back where they'd been and worked out what the currents were doing and tried to locate where Joey could be. And they searched, but they couldn't find him. So after 24 hours, they called off the search, they notified his family that he was missing and presumed dead. But Joey wasn't dead. He was floating in the water. In his marine training, he'd remembered that if you fall overboard, you can actually use your trousers to make a life jacket. So that training had kicked in, he'd made a life jacket, he'd kept himself afloat, and he was treading water. And he was found 72 hours after he fell overboard by some Pakistani fishermen. He was treading water in his sleep. They picked him up, they pulled him onto the boat, and when they pulled him on, they noticed his mouth was just dry. His tongue was cracked, his throat was parched. And Joey survived. A few years later, he was doing an interview, and, and the interviewer asked him, what was it like? What, what were you going through? What were you experiencing as you were out there in the water, hoping to be rescued? And he said that there was one thing 
going through his brain, one, one thought pulsating through his body, and that was water, just water. I just want water. Now, hopefully you haven't been in that kind of situation where you've been that desperate for water. Maybe not physically, but in other ways, you can be really thirsty. You can be thirsty for meaning. You can be thirsty for, for purpose, for, for hope. And so you may not have been to the point where you're at dehydration physically, but spiritually, maybe you've been at that point where you wanted something else. You just wanted a refreshing drink, something to, to cool you down and make you feel that life-sustaining water flowing through your body. Maybe it's peace, maybe it's acceptance, maybe it's purpose. I met a lady who was like that. Um, her name was Rosa. And I first met Rosa when, when I uh, had to go around to her place to drop off a DVD. She'd um, received something in a letterbox and requested that she wanted to see a particular DVD. Um, that got sent to me and I, I got given her address and I went around to drop it off to her. Now when she opened the door I had to look down because she was really short. She still is. She's a, she was a short lady. She uh, was kind of shy, um, kind of um, held back a little bit, a um, little bit tentative. But I gave her the DVD and we started up a bit of a conversation and, and she started to share a bit of her life with me. Um, she'd not too long ago been through a divorce, a separation, um, but only if, uh, about six months before I had met her, um, her mother had passed away, and she'd been very close to her mum. And, and so she was struggling with all these things. She had a son who had some difficulties, and, and she was having to face all this on her own. And she had been to Road to Bethlehem. And at Road to Bethlehem, she'd, she'd heard the story of Jesus. And she was, she was a Greek Orthodox, so she, she grew up knowing about the Bible, about Christianity. But something there sparked in her. And she said, no, I... There's got to be more to this. There's got to be more. So she started this search for something more in her life. And that's when I met her. She was, she was thirsty for something else. Now, you, you probably know people who are like that, who, who have just felt like, this isn't it. There, there's got to be something else that I'm missing. And I've met wealthy people, poor people, successful people, average people, and, and they've all as I've spoken to them, they've all kind of expressed that, hey, maybe, maybe there's, there's something missing. They, they might have put it down to, need to make the business bigger, I need to um, deal with this relationship with someone, or uh, they've found things that they thought that they needed to fix, that they wanted more of. You might know people like that, that might have been your story once, or maybe perhaps today. So you might also be able to relate to, to a lady that is mentioned in the Bible. Jesus met her as he sat next to a well. It was hot. It was the middle of the day, and, and he, he asked her for a drink. And she said, mm, this isn't normal. Um, you shouldn't be asking me for a drink. And, and they went back and forth a bit. And, and Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God, and if you knew who it was that's asking you to get them a drink, you would actually ask me for a drink. And I'd give you a a cool glass of living water. And then she says, where is this? How can I get it? And Jesus essentially says, it's, it's in me. I am the living water. She didn't realize how close she was to the living water. She, it was something that she wanted. It was something that she felt she was thirsty for, but she couldn't, she couldn't get it. She didn't know what it was. She didn't know where to find it. But actually, it was, it was right there next to her. A few, few chapters after that in John, Jesus said this. He said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. John 7, 37. There's two verses I, I want to share with you today, and I hope you can remember them. They're easy. I've cut them back a little bit so you can remember them. John 7, 37. John 7, 37. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The only way to solve a thirst for hope, for meaning, for acceptance, for purpose is to know and accept Jesus. Nothing else is going to truly satisfy. It might 
it might make you feel like you're, you're not thirsty anymore, but it's not fully going to quench. And the irony of it is that you can be thirsty for something, and when you find Jesus and you drink him in, you're still thirsty. It quenches, but you want more of it. With Jesus, you can drink and drink and drink, and it's always cool, it's always refreshing, it's always invigorating. It's both fulfilling and unquenchable. Have you, in your walk with God, in your walk with, with Christ, have you experienced that? That you can spend time and time and time with him, and it quenches, but it also leaves you wanting more. And so I want to ask today, as we start a new year, as we kick off and people are making resolutions, I want to ask you, are you thirsty for Jesus? Do you have a deep, unquenchable desire to drink more of him in each day? Does that drive you to spend more time in his word, to spending more time in prayer, to spending more time talking with him and about him? The story is told of, uh, you might have heard this, of a student who went to his spiritual master. And he asked him, Master, how can I truly find God? And without saying anything, the master guided him down the path to the river that ran just, just near his place. He took him into the water, and the student's thinking, okay, this is great, I'm going to find God. And the master take him, takes him in fairly deep, puts his hand on his head, and pushes him under the water. And holds him there. And the student's thinking, is God under here? I can't see God. And he holds him there. And the master keeps his hand on his head. And slowly, the oxygen in the student's lungs starts getting used up. The carbon dioxide starts building up. And he starts, his brain starts sending messages saying, you need to breathe. You need to get some air. You're running out of air. You need it. You need it. And that feeling starts crushing his lungs, and, and he's held under that. He starts thrashing around and, and trying to get up. But the teacher just holds his head under there, and he keeps it there, and he keeps it there. And that burning is getting stronger and stronger. And this guy, all he's thinking about is, I just need to breathe. I need to breathe. And then finally, at the last minute, just before he's about to drown, he pulls him up out of the water, and the guy <gasps> takes a massive deep breath. And then the teacher looks at him and says, when you desire God as truly as you, de as you desire the air you just breathed, then you will find him. Do you desire God that much? Do you desire Jesus so much that it's like air, it's like water when you're thirsty? I think of David. You know, when David, he, he talks about a deer panting for water. This is a deer that just doesn't want to drink. This is a deer that is desperate for water. And then further on, he says, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek for you. My soul thirsts for you like a dry and weary land. Now, that's some pretty earnest, desperate wanting of some water. And David's, David's not a new believer. David's followed God his whole life. But still, he's desperate and wanting God in his life. Two verses and two things I want to, yeah, I hope you can take home today. John 7, 37, if any of you is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And along with that, may 2016 be a year where you are incredibly thirsty and desperate for Jesus. Living water is available to everyone. But not everyone realizes they're thirsty. It's a common situation where you mistake thirst for hunger. I don't know if you've experienced this. If I have a nap during the middle of the day and I wake up, the first thing that comes to my head, I need to eat. I'm starving. I could have eaten only just two hours before, but I wake up and I'm so hungry. Anyone else? No, it's just me. Thank you. Good. Um, you wake up and you go, oh, I'm so hungry. But in reality, I'm not actually hungry. It's more I'm thirsty. And science has shown us that often we confuse those two sensations. We think we're hungry, but in reality, we just need a glass of water. 
And it's the same with life. People look for, for solutions to things in areas where they, they think they're actually hungry. But I think when you read the Bible, when you understand God, you realize, no, they're actually thirsty for living water. And then not going to find the solution to their thirst until they're shown who the living water is and where to get it. And that's where you come in. I'll just leave them there to look at. And This is the chip program, by the way. Um, <laughs> Food researchers have put a ton of money into these things. The amount of, uh, of dollars they pour into labs, into having chemists, psychologists, technicians working in these uh, super facilities to create what's in this packet is incredible. The, um, they develop them and then they send them out and they put them in front of all these um, different focus groups and these people get paid to sit and eat chips. They sit there and they eat them and then they put their, answer a bunch of questions, all that stuff gets fed through a computer, it gets analyzed and they work out what they need to change to create the perfect can't say no snack. Now, they've actually got in the States um, one, of these, one of these fast food companies, these snack companies, they've got a, a machine that simulates the human mouth. And they've got this machine so they can work out what is the perfect amount of crunch that a chip should have. And for those of you who are interested, it's actually four, four PSI. Um, 300 grams per square centimeter of force creates the perfect chip. I don't know how you're gonna recreate that in your home, but that's how to create a can't say no chip. And they also got this, this thing called vanishing calorific density. Now, vanishing calorific de density, you know when you eat some things like uh, burger rings, Cheetos, you put it in your mouth, two seconds later you wonder what happened? Because it just disappears. It's gone. Now, they've created it, and they know that if it happens fast enough, your brain doesn't actually think you've consumed any calories. And so it doesn't feel like you're filling up, filling up, and so you go and have another one because you just ate some air. It's basically packaged air. It's a brilliant way to make money. But they've worked out there's a science and a psychology behind it. The other thing that they've worked out, and this is probably one of the more, um, more compelling ones that you'll be able to relate to, they've worked out that if you combine just the right amounts, the right quantities of salt, sugar, and fat, you create this place they call the bliss point. And the bliss point is the right optimi optimization of at least two of those three categories. And when you eat it, your brain responds with endorphins. It releases dopamine and you feel good. And you feel good because you just ate it and your brain says, whatever you just did, can you please do it again? Because that felt really good. And so your body says, all right, I've got to do it. So you go in and you do it again. And the same thing happens, and thanks to vanishing calorific density, your brain's still saying, hey, you haven't eaten anything, but it felt good, so go and do what you just did again. And that's how you reach the bottom of a packet of chips. There's science to it, there's psychology behind it. But all of this relies heavily on one ingredient, salt. What's happening inside your mouth? Can you feel it? This is going to sound good. Four pounds per square inch. Mm. There's a lot that goes into a chip. But salt's the most important thing. <laughs> Help yourself. I'll, I'll bring you a plate next time. <laughs> but salt's important because you have it and you go, that tastes good. And so you go for another one. 
And soon enough, you realize, wow, I'm, I'm really thirsty. <sighs> yeah, that's better. The second verse is Matthew 5.13. You are the salt of the earth. It's one you can remember easily. Your contact with all that salt makes you want something to quench the thirst. You are the salt of the earth, Matthew 5.13. You're the saltiness in the world that, that God wants to use to create in other people a thirst for him. What you do, who you are, what you say, how you act, how you live can be so flavorful that people around you say, oh, I need what you've got. You, you've got something that I'm thirsty for. What is it? Where can I find it? How can I get it? A lady, um, Madeleine Langle, said this, We draw people to Christ not by loudly discrediting what they believe or by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are. No, we draw people to Christ by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. You're the salt of the earth. And just after that, Jesus says, you're the light of the world. Let your light shine before men so they can see your good deeds and they can praise who? Not you. They can praise God. As you live a salty life, God will do things through you that will make others thirsty as well. I mentioned Rosa earlier. Um, I dropped that first DVD off to Rosa. And then I dropped the second one and the third one and the fourth one. Rosa went through about three or four correspondence courses. She watched all uh, about three or four different sets of DVDs. Um, she attended a few different seminars. We did Bible studies together. And on December, December 13, last year, two years ago now, December 13, two years ago, um, Rosa committed her life to Christ in baptism. And, and the transformation that I was blessed to be able to see in her life was amazing. It wasn't big things, it was little things that changed in her that other people noticed. She's still short, nothing changed there, but she wasn't as shy, she wasn't as timid, she wasn't as unsure, she wasn't as, as concerned about the future anymore because she'd had a drink of living water. And, and she drank it, and it made her wanting more and more and more of it. She's following Jesus' call to be the salt of the earth. Other people are seeing what's happening in her life, and they're asking questions. They're saying, Rosa, what's changed? What's different? So as you look to the new year ahead, can you remember two verses? John 7, 37, Matthew 5, 13. And I want to encourage you to do two things. A simple plan for 2016, two resolutions that are keepable. Be thirsty. Desire a deeper relationship with Jesus. Desire to spend more time with him. Develop a deeper thirst for him. He's coming back soon. And we want to be ready. And you want to be ready. And you want others to be ready as well. So don't just develop a thirst for him. Don't just be thirsty, but be salty as well. Be a chip. Invite God to make you full of flavor. And, and as you do, pray that he can lead you to the people who, who need to know about living water and that you can have an opportunity to share with them. You know where it is. You know who it is. And, and hopefully they'll be ready when he comes too. Father, we thank you that you have shown us that Jesus is the living water. We thank you that you have invited us to come and drink. And this year, God, may we drink and drink and drink and never be quenched because we know that Jesus is, is so much and, and we can never have enough. We also ask that you'll make us salty. May we be a chip for you in our communities, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our neighborhood, that people will develop a thirst for you and by a grace that we can show them that your love is amazing, that you are a God 
who knows them, who cares for them, and who is coming back to take them home. We ask that you'll give us strength and commitment to this resolution in 2016. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.